morning, everybody. In the past two weeks, we have observed that Saul emerged from a heavy-duty religious background out of a fierce commitment to intense persecution of the Christian church, out of a more than spectacular engagement with myriad interpretations of the Mosaic law, from not being predisposed to the truth of God, to being converted, to being completely changed, to being not just reorientated or reprogrammed, but reborn by the Spirit of God. He had become a new man after being met by God on the road to Damascus, having requested and being granted letters from the high priest to the synagogues in Damascus, authorizing him to take Christians as prisoners back to Jerusalem. God had taken the initiative in Paul's life. His conversion, his transformation was the work of God alone. It was a complete turnaround, a 180 degree switch. The believers in the churches in Judea didn't have a picture of him on their Facebook accounts. He didn't have a profile picture. They knew his profile as it had been, but they did not know his face. And now they knew his profile as it had become after being met by God. So what did they say? Maybe they held church meetings. Maybe they listened very carefully to one another and to God and listened to the reports about the man formerly called Saul. They only heard the report, the man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they took the only decision that they could realistically take. They praised God because of Paul. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that marvellous? They knew what Paul had been like and they had heard what God had done and was doing in his life and they praised God because of him. They did not know his face, but they knew his faith. And that is what he was now preaching. And that is what counts. What God accepts, we accept. Whom God accepts, we accept. Don't we? So then somebody comes into our church from whom we know what they were previously like and in whom we can see what God has done and is doing and we praise God. Is that what we do? Or do we say, hold on a minute, not sure if they should be baptised, not sure if they should share in the Lord's Supper, not sure if they should be given the chance to give a testimony. And whatever you do, don't let them preach. Is that what we might say? Okay. Let's be discerning, but if the truth of the gospel of the grace of God is evident in the life of a new believer, let us not hesitate to welcome them into our fellowship and to praise God for what he is doing. I praise God for those you see during this presentation sharing with us in leading the prayers and in giving the Bible reading. For those who manage the enormous task of putting this presentation together, for the cameraman and the IT workers. And I praise God that he even works in me, which is definitely not an easy task. We move on to chapter 2. We jump 14 years forwards and we land in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the heartland of monotheistic Judaism. This was Paul's second visit to Jerusalem, having enjoyed 15 days there previously, getting to know, amongst others, the Apostle Peter. Paul took two very different believers with him. Barnabas, a man of faith, a great encourager, and on home ground because he was a Jew, and Titus, an uncircumcised Jew, a non-Jew, a product of Paul's missionary work and endeavours. That was a very interesting combination of travel partners, a well-balanced trio. 
Leading this group, Paul set out on the gospel that he was preaching amongst the non-Jews. Not so that he could at last find out where the truth lay. He'd been preaching this gospel for 14 years. He knew what he was talking about. He did it to state clearly what the truth of the gospel was. When I was younger, I really loved watching ice hockey gold miners and really wanted to become one myself. There was only one basic problem. I could not skate. So I watched ice hockey and I played field hockey. I remember once going with one of my daughters to an ice hockey game at our home rink. We stood proudly amongst the home supporters in the stadium waiting for the match to start and then we saw we had a really small problem. Our team was playing in its usual blue and white colours and I was wearing a white jacket but the opposition was wearing green and white which matched my daughter's colours perfectly. How would the home fans react to the colours my daughter was wearing? Paul was asking himself the same question. Barnabas as a Jew was on home ground but bringing Titus, an uncircumcised non-Jew, a product of his work amongst the non-Jews, his own product was going to be more than a little difficult. Paul loved and trusted Titus and regarded him as a valuable associate. He described him as his brother and as a true son in their common faith. What would be the reaction of the apostles in Jerusalem to Paul's non-Jewish companion and to his work amongst the non-Jews? Would they accept Titus as a brother or would they reject him because he was uncircumcised? And beyond that, would they endorse Paul's gospel? Would they accept it or would they attempt to modify it in some way or other? For you see, there were many people who had developed a different gospel, a fake gospel, a deadly gospel, the Judaizers were saying that the teaching faith plus grace equals salvation was wrong. They were requiring that something be added to the gospel message. They were insisting on another, on a further ingredient, faith plus obedience to the law of Moses in all its many facets. They wanted to destroy the freedom that the Christians were enjoying. In Acts 15 verse 1 we read, Some men came down from Antioch and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, sorry but you cannot be saved. These Christians from a Jewish background said that Gentiles, that is to say non-Jews, could indeed be saved if they made themselves Jews first and brought themselves under the law of Moses. Their idea was that salvation in Jesus was only for the Jewish people and that Gentiles had to become Jews before they could become Christians. And parallel to their false teaching, they aimed to wreck the unity of the apostles. They were claiming that the church was being troubled by two gospels, Peter's gospel and Paul's gospel, each claiming to be of divine origin. And they were saying that the apostles were contradicting each other. Maybe you're asking yourself the question, is this account of the visit to Jerusalem in Galatians 2 referring to the same visit as described in Acts 15? If you have this question, it may help you to refer to the link to this theme in the text of this message on the homepage. My understanding is that this trip to Jerusalem referred to in Galatians 2 is most likely the one mentioned in Acts 11, 27 to 30, when Paul brought a gift from Christians in other cities to the Christians in Jerusalem who suffered under famine. Galatians 2 verse 10 gives us a hint in that direction. But be that as it may, the issue that was being raised on this trip was not a marginal issue, it was a main issue. It was an important issue. It was indeed a central issue. So maybe you ask yourself the question, why then did Paul write, for fear that I was running or had run my race in vain? You may be asked, what did Paul have to be scared about? This probably didn't come from the fear that he himself would fall away. 
probably it was the fear that an unnecessary conflict with the leaders of the church in Jerusalem might damage his reputation or damage his ministry in some way. Also the danger was that, that false teachers, if encouraged in some way by the leaders in Jerusalem, might undo Paul's work in planting churches, undo his work in raising disciples for Jesus, and that therefore his work would have been in vain. That's what he tried to avoid. Paul knew he had the true gospel, but he didn't know how everyone of reputation in Jerusalem, how the apostles would react to it. He did not know how they would receive it. Perhaps some of the apostles themselves were wrong on this point and would need to be corrected. But if there was any confrontation to be done, Paul did it privately to those who were of authority. He did the best he possibly could to, to avoid embarrassing publicly those who were highly regarded in Jerusalem. His strategy was very simple. He stuck to his guns. He did not give in to those who would have wanted Titus to have been circumcised. He would have allowed it to protect the faith of weaker brothers and sisters, but he was not going to let it go through if it meant a watering down of the gospel. So he says, we did not give in to them for one minute. Why not? Should he not have been more tolerant? Shouldn't he have been more warm-hearted? Shouldn't he have had more understanding for the opinion of others? See, Paul's aim was that the truth of the gospel would remain with those God had led to faith in him, and that the truth of the gospel would remain with the churches he had with God's help grounded and established. Well, I hear you thinking and saying, what are you talking about? This may be really very interesting, but circumcision is not really a problem in our church. And you know, I completely agree with all of you. But it would be a problem if there are things that are additional to faith and grace that we would insist on as being essential for salvation. You see, the fundamental issue here is, the main question here is, what are the parameters of Christian freedom? On what does our freedom as Christians depend? Are faith and the grace of God enough? Living in a family of five with my wife and three daughters gave me many opportunities to go food shopping and you know I actually enjoy that. But I was always happier going setting off in the car just having had a quick general look around the kitchen and more than occasionally before I got out I was confronted by a friendly member of the family pointing out there is actually a shopping list lying on the microwave ready, me ready for me. Well, I never really like shopping with a list because it's kind of difficult to take advantage of, of special offers. It's rather hard to buy fresh items of really good quality. And of course, it takes ages to find everything, even presupposing you've deciphered what has been written on the list. It was always nevertheless a really great joy to have found everything on the list and to travel home thinking that was once again a good job done. Arriving home, I was frequently met by one of my four ladies with the comment, I'm sorry, but we forgot to put something on the list. The gospel as it sounds is not something that we would make up <coughs> our own list. Is something missing? Isn't there another way to earn salvation? If we are religious enough, if we develop an appropriate alternative worldview, how grateful we all should be to know that there is nothing missing on the list that Paul sets out as the requirements we have to be saved. Faith plus grace equals salvation. That is all we need. There is nothing missing on his list. There is nothing missing at all from his gospel. We do not need to add anything to it. We do not need to get back into the car and drive to other destinations to obtain other ideas. 
other religious concepts or other elements of particular philosophical systems in order to be saved. We don't need to do that. We live in a post-Christian age, so how important it is for us to have a renewed understanding of the reality of sin. We really need that. Because if there's no understanding of sin, there's no desire for salvation. And in this day and age, instead of knowing they're lost, people feel lonely and they feel disconnected. Instead of an awareness of sin, they have just a sense of hopelessness. And self-discovery has replaced a desire to be saved. So what do we do? We need to walk with people through the real world effects of the decisions that they take including being open and being transparent about our own failings, about our own mistakes and their consequences. We need a recognition of the need for salvation. It isn't necessary for us to adopt every new term that comes along, but we need to be aware of them so we can understand what people are telling us. Only then will we be able to communicate compassionate truth in a way that they will be able to hear. People still need Jesus, but the terms they use to describe that have changed. They need to be reconnected to their maker. They need to see how lonely Jesus was in the wilderness as he was tempted, how lonely he was on the way to the cross, but they need to say, see that he was lonely, but never alone. And through his death on the cross and his resurrection, we can be reborn to a new and living hope. As we read in first letter of Peter chapter 1 verses 3 to 5, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, never spoil, never fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. We need an acceptance of salvation through Christ alone. Not lives given over to the slavery of self-discovery. You know, even after being drawn to Jesus, people are more likely to try to add Jesus to their current lifestyle than to abandon sinful behaviours as a necessary element in embracing biblical discipleship. And the idea that there are multiple paths to truth is much more palatable to post-Christian people than accepting Jesus' claim of exclusivity. We must not obscure the gospel by seeing other issues as more important. That is to say, we, we dare not obscure the gospel by emphasizing things that are actually external to the gospel as, of they are, as, of, as if they are part of it, as if they are central to it. They aren't. Our gospel is not irrelevant. But if we fear that our gospel may be irrelevant, we may come to the point where we start bending and shaping and forming the gospel to fit nicely in with the culture. And in the process of doing that, the true gospel will be lost and we'll finish up with a mixed syncretistic version of it. Which way should we go? Convert the culture? Condemn the culture? Or consume the culture? A hard prosperity gospel exclaims very loudly that financial blessing and physical well-being are always the will of God for disciples of Christ and that faith positive speech and, of course, donations to religious causes will increase one's material wealth. Prosperity theology views the Bible as a contract between God on the one hand and humans on the other. And if humans have faith in God, he will deliver. 
Likewise, the tragedy of soft prosperity gospel thinking is the way it focuses so much on earthly improvements. It offers Christians their best life now. The eternal realities of heaven and hell are lost. This brings a very real and very sad possibility. It is really tragic that many who hear the so-called prosperity gospel are lost and remain lost. Ted Nelson put it really well in this sense, I th sentence, I think. If you want to know why there are so many downtrodden, defeated Christians, just look at the message they are taught. Saved by grace. Transformed by will-powered performance modification. Down the centuries, man in his pride has struggled to accept his total dependence on the grace of God. Men from the beginning of the church age have sought to mix religious tradition and the basic philosophy of this world back in. Mixing the idea that we become by doing into the gospel of grace. Paul warned the Galatians that to mix even a little doing to become with grace would change the good news, the gospel, into no gospel at all, bad news. In Paul's eyes, the message of grace was the gospel. Now obviously, if we're looking for healing or spiritual direction from esoteric teaching, from witchcraft or from anywhere else other than in Christ, then our total dependency on our Lord has been diluted, maybe even completely washed away. This kind of, pro of approach changes the gospel. It creates a mix of multiple gods and therefore denies Christ his rightful place as the one and only Lord in the life of the believer. And those who would mix these practices, if not moving away from them, end up with a false syncretistic gospel, not the gospel of Jesus. See, a basic principle of of man's religious logic is God blesses those who deserve to be blessed. And so religion across the world in its multitude of forms presents man with various requirements for works that he must fulfill, that he must achieve in order to attain, in order to receive, in order to gain God's blessing. But Paul also, Paul also warned to mix man's performance into the message of grace would result in the gospel becoming powerless. Powerless to change a man from the inside out. He'd be left merely trying to change from the outside in a kind of behavior modification. And that does not work. So don't let us, don't let me tamper with the gospel. Don't let us change it. Don't let us modify it. Don't let us dilute it so that people can find it easier to swallow. We should not do that. Don't let political mandates or psychological theories or whatever become necessary for us to be accepted in the church. We do not have to be a member of a polit particular political party to be accepted by God. Well, I've been very pleasantly surprised walking around Blackburn to see so many German-made cars including many BMWs. The BMWs uh, offer a competition package with very wide-ranging extensive claims. They say extra power means extra performance. The M3 sedan and the M4 coupe with optional seven-speed M double clutch transmission sprint from rest to 100 kilometers an hour in just 4.0 seconds without the package in 4.1 seconds. While the M4 convertible reaches the same speed in 4.3 seconds, without the package in 4.4 seconds. The sprint time for models with the standard six-speed manual transmission is likewise 0.1 seconds faster in all cases than without the package. Just think with me for a minute. Do we need a package with extras like that in our spiritual life? In order, so to speak, to get into heaven 0 0.1 seconds earlier. 
Let us have no doubt whatsoever that a securely growing faith in the finished work of Christ is the way to go. But without options. Not performance orientated. Forgetting what is behind and pressing on towards what is ahead. Well, think for a minute about what we eat. Do we need dietary supplements? That's okay. Iron or zinc or magnesium or whatever. That's really fine. But the gospel is not like that. We don't need any extras. And there is something else very special. There are no hidden extras that we have to pay for later. Well, I can hear you saying, I can hear you thinking, this grace plus faith equals salvation model. It's fine as a starter. We can sort of begin there. But don't we need more tolerance? Tolerance is a kind of religious right, isn't it? It's maybe the circumcision of the modern age, maybe the circumcision of the post-Christian era. More tolerance of different ways of viewing and thinking about the Bible. Don't we need more flexibility in our thinking about sexual orientation and behavior? Maybe you say, don't we need more options in our consideration of the concepts of the family? Really? Are you serious? This is God's word. The one who made you and made me and keeps you and keeps me. He got this written for each one of us to understand what the truth is. It does not need any add-ons. We need to be open to God speaking to us through his word and to the leading of the Holy Spirit who lives within us. Paul had taken a non-Jewish companion and a non-Jewish gospel with him to Jerusalem into the very heartland of monotheistic Judaism. He must have really wondered what reaction am I going to get there from the apostles. Would they accept, would they receive Titus as a brother or reject him because he was uncircumcised? Would they accept Paul's gospel or would they attempt to modify it in some way or other? We have seen this morning that Titus was accepted and Paul's gospel also. This was a massive and a resounding victory for the truth of the gospel. The heavyweights, the original members, the writers of scripture, the founders of the church.